here we are. Are you familiar with um, Jamie Pennebaker? Yep. At all? Yeah. And I, his his book, uh, The Secret Life of Pronouns, I've, I've, it stuck with me. I had him on the show years ago. And, and one of the things that blew me away is he... he taking algorithms and looking through people's tweets. One of the things that that was interesting was he, he took uh, he, dark poets and had an algorithm analyze it and predict half of them had killed themselves, half of them hadn't. And, and he had the algorithm predict which ones killed themselves quite, uh, quite accurately. Wow. And one of the big, um, one of the big differences was the use of the word I, so, uh, mm. so the, the ones that killed themselves would refer to themselves quite a bit. It'd be a lot of I and me and those sorts of things. Whereas the other dark poets were talking more existential about more generally about life and us. And, and one of the, one of the potential, um, uh, actionable, uh, things about knowing this is, is, I, I believe some therapists are trained if they have a client that they notice saying I quite a bit, have them be like, well, how does that, how do you think it makes this person feel? Or if they're only complaining about the other person, having them say, well, how does that make you, fe you feel? And so there's some something about toggling between the introspective and and kind of thinking about others that that creates a more holistic picture and seems to lead to better um, mental health in individuals. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you ask somebody, so what have the two last two years been about? And they say, well, this is this very distressing xenobiotic pathogen that has caused a pandemic and has enormous public health and economic consequences. Or you say, so what has the last two years been about? I wake up every morning wondering if today is the day I'm going to drown from fluids in my lungs. Mm -hmm. You know, those are two very different takes on what this is about. Um, you know, reducing it to one of these building blocks, and this one sounds like this This should be in a doily and every, like, you know, up there in Minnesota kind of thing. Um, you look at non-human primates, they spend a lot of time socially grooming. It's like this social gossip connectiveness thing, and they do it after a scare with a predator. They do, And you keep track of how much each animal is involved in a grooming relationship. And it turns out more grooming is associated with lower stress hormone levels. The better predictor is not how much any individual is being groomed. It's how much they are grooming someone else. So some sort of macaque monkey equivalent of getting out of your head, even in terms of, you know, giving comfort rather than pulling on it. Yeah, we get lost in our heads very readily. I mean, one of the classic sound bites about depression is it's aggression turned inward, just all the stuff going on inside. And whether it's going on inside I failed and I'm always going to fail or what's going on inside is, oh my God, did that mild cough just now mean the flu is you're building up in my left lung? In either case, you're stuck inside your head and that's often not a very comforting place. Hmm. I, I, I'm wondering if, um, if you could talk a little bit about what the last couple of years have been like for you in terms of what what of some aspects of your work have uh, ha have seemed the most relevant to everything that's happened during the pandemic? Well, certainly psychological stress, uh, like go figure, and there's just tsunamis now of anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, mood disorders that are just like overwhelming mental health capacities in this country, um, long neglected, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, obviously psychological stress, but probably the most interesting aspect of it is those you know, sort of the behavioral consequences of this sort of stress. And you know, deep psychological stress during this period 
and lack of control, predictability, et cetera, et cetera. And the most screwed up form of socialization that we could possibly get as social primates, you spend two years during this terrifying, isolating time trying to figure out why the sound is off on your Zoom connection and ooh, you forgot to unmute <laughs> kind of thing. That's going to be your basis of feeling, you know, we are the world kind of connectedness. So that's been done in. But I think what's been most interesting is you see with chronic stress, your memory gets bad and you're more depressive and you're more anxious and you have trouble making judgments and you have trouble regulating your impulses. But what really goes down the tubes is you have trouble being empathic about other people and other people who are very different from you. Stress like 24 straight months of it, takes people and it causes a tunnel vision about as to who counts as an us and whose perspective you are able to take. And even when you're watching somebody in pain, what parts of your brain activate and respond? Well, it depends on who they are. It depends whether they look like someone like me, all this modulatory stuff. And it gets mighty hard to like walk in somebody else's shoes during periods of severe stress. And, you know, that's what the last two years have been about. I mean, I'm sure like everyone had that like nostalgia now for the first like two hours or two weeks of the pandemic of saying, whoa, this is awful, but the whole world is going through this. We're all in this together. And then what we quickly saw was, no, we're not all in this together. If you are <laughs> of the wrong socioeconomic status, if you were the wrong religious or racial or ethnic outgroup, you're going to be feeling that pandemic 10 times worse than the people who could sit at home and work remotely and like right. Zoom with their loved ones. This has been like one amazing exercise in parochialism, which is to say narrowing your concerns only to whoever counts as an us and being less empathic and more selfish. And, you know, every frontline worker has shown us that times like this could bring out the most amazing in humans. But what stress mostly does is bring out the worst in us. And that mm -hmm. sure has weighed on me in these last two years watching just how awful this has been. Yeah. I just had an ER doc on the show and asked him how he was doing and everything. And he was just like, I don't, this is no longer a life passion of mine. It's just a job that I go in and do. And I just don't have the capacity to care anymore about, you know, I do a good job and I, I, I do what I'm supposed to do, but it's no longer this dream that I was pursuing and a yeah. sense of pride and fulfillment and everything and just run down. And that's everything related to uh, the pandemic changed what it was caused by. Just to like artificially dichotomize for the first year, it was an infectious disease disorder. It was an infectious disease crisis. Um, mm -hmm. ever since the vaccines have come out, it's been a crisis of societal dysfunction. It's been a human-made crisis. It's not caused by, oh my God, this has been a 10-year project to come up with vaccines. It could have been done at the end of 2020, early 2021. And the fact that it has gone on in many ways is worse since then, it's got nothing to do with viral mutation rates. It's human cause. And I think for the like frontline people, you know, in the early months or whatever, they're sitting there saying, we're working around the clock. Um, this could very readily kill me because it's killing all sorts of medical people. I can't see my loved ones because I don't want to get them infected. But this is what I trained for. This is what, this is going to be the most awful stretch of my life, but we're going to hold on until they come up with the vaccine. That's what we, and we did it. We made it there, you made it. And then, God damn it, it's all of it all over again. All of that mm -hmm. that we spent a year sacrificing for turned out to be nothing because of these idiots who turned this into a disease of social dysfunction. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's 
incredibly devastating, or maybe another way of stating that is they spent the first year having a sense of control. If I just work around the clock and intubate people and check and check and more and more careful, and so I can get some sort of control, if not on the planet, at least over this person dying in my ICU. And then it turns out you had no control at all because all sorts of people decide the disease is a myth or mm-hmm. vaccines are containing contraceptives or God knows what, you know, urban myths are going into anti-vaxxers. And <laughs> I've heard no, them all. <laughs> I thought I had control over this as long as I worked as hard as I ever have in my life. And it turned out that I didn't. And that's exactly why why this guest of yours is in the state of mind you describe. <laughs>